I grew up, I was a tomboy, I was looking at photographs of myself as a youngster recently, and uh, I was dressed in a pair of shorts, a t-shirt, and I had a gun and holster on. <laughs> I grew up in Harold's Cross, and I well remember riding up and down the road on my friend's bike, shooting everybody in sight. <laughs> Um, the second phase then is coming out to others and that's coming out to friends and coming out at work perhaps and the third one then is coming out in public so I came out to myself in 1969 and it sort of happened by accident I was a late entrant to nursing I didn't start nurse training until I was 23 I read for a degree in English first and I was attending a lecture by that famous poet uh, Ivan Boland and she began to talk about a book called The Well of Loneliness by a woman called Radcliffe Hall and the central character in that book is a lesbian woman well I was 19 I must have been very green but I'd never heard of the word lesbian before and I thought this woman sounds a bit like me the central character in the novel <laughs> so after the lecture I scuttled off to Trinity Library and I looked up lesbian, and it said, it's a woman who loves women. Well, Eureka! <laughs> I said to myself, that must be me! <laughs> so anyway, I filed that away, and I did absolutely nothing about it until I was 36. I didn't do anything about it at all. And um, I asked myself, what, did, what happened to my sexual drive? Where did that all go? Well, do you know what? I think I have it finally figured out. <laughs> I think I sublimated it. <laughs> because during that time, I did five bachelor's degrees, as well as nursing. <laughs> and I completed four master's. <laughs> I suppose I made some use of the time between coming out to myself <laughs> and coming out to others. I did come out to my friends, as I say, and uh, that was somewhat difficult because it's rather difficult to tell people that you've known all your life. Um, in, in a sense, it's almost more difficult to tell them than tell people that you've just met um, because you're telling them that you've concealed something fundamental about yourself until this moment in time. I suppose what prompted me to come out was that I, I was up in UCD at a women's event and I met a few other women and we started to talk and it turned out they were lesbian and it turned out that they were rather like me. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I began then to have the courage to think in terms of telling people that I also was lesbian. However, at work I made a conscious decision that I would never come out. At least I felt I would never come out at work unless it was absolutely necessary to help somebody else. Or if somebody asked me was I lesbian, I would have said yes. But nobody asked me, so I remained silent. Also, I was conscious of the fact that I was in a management position since 1986, <coughs> coincidentally. And um, also that the places where I worked, both in the hospice and before that, were, if you like, religious institutions. So while I didn't think I'd be dismissed, I thought that I had better not confuse the issue or muddy the waters. That was the choice I made, and that was the choice that made me feel comfortable. In reality, nowadays, I don't think it was a very good choice. I think it would have been better to have been visible, but that was the choice I made at the time and it gave me a relatively comfortable way of dealing with things, except on social occasions, on coffee breaks and so forth, when everybody was talking about their children and their husband, and uh, I felt, oh, I'm different, I'm not part of this. So that, that was the pain of it, I suppose, um, and that was the inevitable pain of it. But I have to take responsibility for my own choices, and I chose not to come out at work. However, I did make a conscious decision to start blabbing as soon as I retired. <laughs> so, 
I retired in 2010 and I haven't shut up since. <laughs> so I'll make the best of it in the heyday of my life. Um, how did I get support? Okay, I sublimated my sexuality for, for a number of years, but how did I get support? Well, essentially, um, I went offline. Um, I, along with another nurse, um, went to England and we met a group of women that called themselves the Julian Fellowship. And the Julian Fellowship in England described itself as a spirituality group. Uh, I was a Christian and my, my other nurse friend was just about to start training as a psychoanalyst. So she was into psychoanalytical theory and I was vaguely into spirituality. And we decided that we'd go back to Dublin and we'd set up this group and we'd call it the Julian Fellowship simply because we couldn't think of anything else to call it. <laughs> so we started it in uh, 1987. Um, I knew a, a, a priest who was a lecturer in ethics. At that stage I had completed a, a degree in theology and biblical studies <laughs> as well as psychology. So I knew everybody. <laughs> And I asked him, could we have a room in his community house? And he said, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> because he was already housing uh, an equivalent male group called Reach. And um, basically we put an ad in the gay community news and uh, it had a box number, no names attached. And uh, what appeared to the Julian Fellowship were women like ourselves, professional women, largely teachers, scared of being outed, um, uh, nurses of course, social workers um, and people in marriages who had not yet come out of their marriage but, but knew they were lesbian. And um, we had a, a number of sessions, shared sessions with uh, the men's group Reach from time to time and we had liturgies with them. Uh, we described ourselves as a spirituality so stroke self-development group and that group continued on until the beginning of this century. And uh, we continued to meet in the Dublin-based religious house. Um, I have a lot of good friends from that group. And uh, if I hadn't had the support of that group, um, I don't know where I would have been. Um, because it was a safe place to talk. We met once or twice a month, definitely once a month. And um, we were free to be ourselves. And that was really good, even if it was still in the closet, so to speak. But things move on. <laughs> and uh, in two uh, about two years ago, uh, I got the opportunity to be a chairperson uh, of OWLS, Older, Wiser Lesbians. And that's an online social support group for older lesbian women. So you might say that we arrived <laughs> online. <laughs> And of course, at that stage, I was perfectly happy to be out and to talk about owls because I had retired and I had no other strings attached to me. So I, I was free to talk about owls and publicise owls. There are about um, uh, 130 women in owls and uh, we engage in a variety of activities. However, because of our age group, our oldest member is uh, 78 and our younger members would be, would be in their late 40s. Um, there was some difficulty coming to terms with being online. <laughs> and I still get frequent calls of, I'm offline, I can't see this month's calendar, can you help me? <laughs> well, of course, I wasn't too good myself. So fortunately, um, another member was an ex-nurse, interestingly enough, and she became an IT officer um, in the health services in England before she retired. So she's now the OWL's IT officer. So the members come screaming to me, and I go screaming to her. <laughs> and between us, we actually manage to cope somehow. <laughs> um, <laughs> so again, this is a very active group. <laughs> Um, we are online, most of us, <laughs> most of the time. We're a nationwide group. We're basically for the over 40s. Um, we have a sister group 
those of you who may be um, lesbian and uh, who may not be over 40. We have a sister group called Running Amok, and that's accessible on www.runningamok.ie. It's one of the meet-up sites, and um, they run a variety of activities as well. We have, as I say, around 130, 150 members. Some are in the closet, some are out, some are single, some are partnered, some are in, in, still in marriages. So um, our activities, for example, tomorrow I am departing to the west of Ireland on a week's holiday with owls, and we've rented a couple of houses, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be away for a week. We go bowling, um, we play bulls on Dolly Mount Strand, so if you see a lot of queer women down on Dolly Mount Strand, <laughs> you'll know it's owls. <laughs> We go out to the pictures, we eat in each other's houses, we have barbecues, we go to the zoo to join our compatriots. <laughs> and uh, We do all the normal things that you might expect people of our age group to do, and a few other little odds and ends, <laughs> which may not be quite so normal. <laughs> so, um, I suppose that's how I got support. I got it outside of nursing. I got it outside of my profession. I didn't expect my profession to provide it and um, like what was said this morning I remember very well the first lecture that our tutor gave us I started nursing in um, 1973 and uh, she told us you're here to look after other people so think of it this way when you come in in the morning leave yourself outside the door look after other people while you're on duty and collect yourself when you go outside the door to go home again. Now, even at 23, I thought that was a bit odd. I thought, <laughs> how the hell am I going to do that? <laughs> anyway, we all managed in one way or another. <laughs> but that was the ethos at the time. And I suppose that was the message we received um, in relation to nursing at the time. Um, Mel has uh, talked about societal attitudes and Mel you touched a bit on church attitudes um, I got a present of this book uh, about two days ago and it's um, by Michael Murphy you know Michael Murphy the newsreader and it's called The Republic of Love and Michael Murphy had a civil partnership in 2011 but he has written uh, a poem about religious attitudes um, when he was growing up and it seemed to me that they were quite like what I heard when I was growing up and um, because I, I worked largely in institutions run by religious people of one denomination or other it was a message that I heard so I'll just read it out to conclude Michael Murphy calls this poem the people of the book and by that he means uh, people of the Bible or people of the Abrahamic tradition, uh, in other words, Jews, Christians and Muslims. The people of the book condemn me for being a person who loves those of my own sex. The Christians, the Muslims and even the Jews believe that God says for me to be loving, I'd have to be living in sin. The Nazis decided I'm Untermensch, a subhuman person, to be burned in the ovens of Buchenwald. The German Pope, following on in that tradition, decreed that as a human being I'm intrinsically disordered, with a tendency towards evil. A ranking so far beneath that of the heterosexual elect that I'm destined to be burned in the fires of hell for all eternity. The people of the book see nothing wrong with that prejudice. They consider themselves nice people. If it were up to them, but it's not. God is the despot here. The people of the book believe I have a dialectic of sexuality, which must be suppressed for the sake of the family or because the grotesquerie of gay marriage poses the biggest threat to civilization, bigger than even global warming. Do the people of the book hold and hope that the millions of us will be obliterated off the face of the earth? 
Or should we voluntarily submit ourselves to castration by dogma for differing sexually from the majority? The people of the book ignore the advances in human psychology, which say that my dialectic of sex is a normal outcome of the Oedipus complex. They say that they take their instruction from Moses and Jesus and Muhammad, whom they preach with all the fanatical certainty of the ignorant and insecure. The people of the book suggest that I should press my sexuality between the leaves of the good book so that it can wither away like a desiccated flower. For according to them, my out sexuality is not orthodox, not sanctioned by people who monopolise the deity. The tragedy for me is that the people of the book would exclude me from a sense of the sacred, which I find in the wonder of love and in the various expressions of human nature. I can hear God speak through the human voice that tells me I'm all right despite my differences, that encourages me to continue on when times get tough, helping me to hope for better, that is humble enough to walk beside me on the road on every journey of my life, that makes a commitment to a fellow human being, reaching out to lift the heavy burden off my shoulders, that trusts me unconditionally with the courage to live out my truth in spite of doubt, responsible only to the best that I can be, flowering in my own way and at my own pace without feeling the need to berate me as a scapegoat, an outsider, a stranger, the prodigal son or daughter. That can always say to me, the Jew, me, the Christian, me, the Muslim, me, the son and daughter of God, I believe in you because I love you and also because you are mine, says the Lord. So that's just a testament by Michael Murphy and it contains certainly some of the prejudices that I came across um, growing up, making the journey of life, making the journey to come out um, to myself firstly, to my friends then, um, on and off a little bit at work and eventually to come out in public, which I hope gives me solidarity with others and it gives me a visibility. And I refer you then to the report, um, which will probably be talked about um, later on in the afternoon, um, Visible Lives, Identifying the Needs of Older LGBT People in Ireland, which was published in 2011. And you can get the key points just down at the table there. So thank you very much.